Hello and welcome to Mystery Us. I'm Tony Pratt, your host for Mystery Us. And on today's edition of the program, we have a guest who is an author of 14 books, an investigative mythologist, seeker and teacher, William Henry. How you doing, William? Great, Tony. Thanks. Welcome to Mystery Us. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, William, you had been, I should say, welcome back to Mystery Us because we had done a previous show. And uh, at the end of that sh program, we were talking about the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, uh, The Illuminator, about Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, refer to uh, a possible candidate for the Holy Grail called the alabaster box or alabastron, mm -hmm. which is a special kind of container. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, when I'm talking about Mary Magdalene, what, what, what my research reveals is she was a tremendously, not only a tremendously inspired person, but a tremendously knowledgeable person about a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, she's Jesus' chief apostle. Okay, so she's not you know, some kind of run-of-the-mill prostitute like you know, some people want you to believe. Like the Catholic Church, not mm -hmm. a shot. At, that's not a shot at the church. That's just what they what they think. Right. That's not happening. When you when you look into the scholarly research about Mary Magdalene, they say that she was part of a, a lineage of of priestesses that go back into ancient Egypt, who had incredible knowledge about perfuming. She was a perfumer. She had knowledge about ancient spirituality, and ultimately, it's possible and. A lot of different Magdalene scholars will say this, that she was actually a priestess of Isis from Egypt. And when you follow that line of thinking, it's like, wait a minute, all of a sudden Isis has uh, responsibility for this device we've talked about before called the Osiris device, mm -hmm. the ladder or stairway to heaven, which was also called the tower. And in fact, when you're talking about Mary Magdalene, her name Mary means beloved, Magdala or Magdalene means the tower. So her name means the Beloved Tower. And you have to wonder, if she is a priestess of Isis, did Mary Magdalene, in fact, know the secrets of the ancient Egyptian tower, the ladder or stairway to heaven, mm -hmm. which was an instrument of some kind that was also portrayed as a canister that held the soul of the Savior, the Egyptian Savior, Osiris. I mean, you're talking about an extraordinary technology now. You're talking about Mary Magdalene conceivably having knowledge about how to contain a soul or pres preserve a soul in an instrument or device called the alabastron. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that was the contemporary terminology. In Egypt, it's called the tower or the Osiris device. Mary Magdalene's time, it's called the alabastron. And you just have to wonder, what are we talking about here? Is it possible? that she did in fact possess this extraordinarily advanced knowledge that she probably learned in Egypt and that that is the true secret of the Holy Grail. And this alabastron was a cup shape or crucible shaped uh, container mm -hmm. that was used for chemicals when they were heated to very extreme temperatures? We're talking about alchemy here. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about <laughs> containers that, that have this capability, we're talking about alchemy. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is one of the, the key parts of the Jesus and Mary Magdalene story because, remember, Mary Magdalene appears in, in Jesus' life in Capernaum when he's having these debates with the, with the elders about manna. He's, they're talking about him as the Messiah, and the, and the elders, the Jewish elders, are saying, look, if you're Moses or Elijah return, then you know, one of your responsibilities is to make the manna. Well, the manna that we're talking about in the Egyptian tradition was this, they called it the white powder gold. Mm -hmm. It had all these incredible magical properties. We're, we're told that they could take some of this manna substance and sprinkle it on, say, a 50-ton block of red granite, and it would levitate. It would float. Wow. And they, they used that as an explanation for how they move the massive 50, 100, 250 ton blocks that you find inside the Great Pyramid. We can't move those with a crane today. Yeah. So but it's the, like anti-gravity powder? It's <laughs> anti-gravity powder, I need that yeah. for my magic act. Exactly. <laughs> and, and the Egyptian pharaohs talked about ingesting this substance. They mm -hmm. drank it and it fed their light bodies. They believed it was like an immortality powder. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they called white bread, the bread, the manna. Right. And so when the Jewish elders are saying to Jesus, hey, if you think you're Moses or like Moses who was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and who also manufactured this powder, then it's time for you to, to bring it on. 
And so here comes Mary Magdalene into the story at that right moment right there when all of a sudden they're telling him to produce this alchemical substance. And that's when they link up. That's when they become partners. And I think the reason is, is because he knew that Mary Magdalene had this tremendous insight and training that she received in Egypt. And they were right there to work together to make their, their project happen. It's amazing how you see the uh, biblical movies and everyone's wearing sandals and living in dirt. There's no, oh, it's so there's no factories or technology or anything. It, and all that it, stuff was around then. I mean, we know that. I it's, mean, it's pathetic to it's me. Just, they treat Jesus and Mary Magdalene and Moses like cartoon characters, you know, yeah. like felt board characters in Sunday school. You know, come on. When was the last time you saw a depiction of Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem that Herod rebuilt with a 10-story tower out front? Right. They never, ever show stuff like that. Instead, they've got them as these, they show Jesus usually as this sort of hayseed hick who acts stoned or something because mm -hmm. he's always oh, blissed Loves out. Everybody, oh, yeah. I love everybody. And I'm <laughs> blissed out. And I'm always looking at you like, you know, looking through you or something. He's nonviolent. He's nonviolent. And, you know, come on, show him in a temple. Show him doing some, some research. Show him with, you know, people that are ex of extreme intelligence and capability and, and you're going to get my attention because that's yeah, if you look at the lost were. books i mean jesus definitely had a temper or he you know when people attacked him you know bad things happened to him just like when they attacked the prophets in the old testament right you know uh god or 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 just their very beingness something would the angels would protect him or or or, or different things like that uh now in the alabaster box um and then this was the box that was procured by Mary Magdalene, right. according to one of the lost books, uh, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. Now, in that version, the alabaster box supposedly contains the foreskin of Jesus. Oh, really? That when he was circumcised on the eighth day by a Hebrew, Hebrew woman that was huh. acting as the mole. Hmm. Um, a little bit of a DNA the evidence the going on too, there, I huh? guess. But, and also in the story, it, it said that Mary was fed by the hands of angels because she was raised in the temple and the there were angels out there. And people were watching them give her manna and she was eating. Incredible. So when you're talking about the angels, you're not talking about the Hallmark card angels. You're talking about immaterial beings, ephemeral right. beings that can even take material form. I mean, sure. there's lots of examples of where these beings are. On one hand, they're, they're beings of light. Then on the other, they're sitting down, they're eating. Like as the angels that appeared to Abraham in the Old Testament is a classic example of mm -hmm. beings that are identified as angels, but Abraham fed them human food. So they probably came from another realm and then have the ability or capability of materializing in this realm. So maybe that's what you're talking about when the angels are feeding Mary Magdalene. Right, and somehow these these angels are, are like intermediate beings or they're like a higher self. They're somehow connected to right. us. And, and and they you know they they serve a very important function mm -hmm. of you know they're messengers of course but also uh, they they affect nature and, and different things. Yeah. Uh, well, to me, the rubber chicken just came out of the ceiling when you said the word higher self, mm -hmm. because from the Gnostic Gnostic perspective, I mean, that's what they th they taught that this is a world of illusion. Mm -hmm. that our pure self, our real self, remains back in the source and a part of us is projected into this realm sort of like a puppet on a string and comes into this realm to experience and to learn the life lessons. But ultimately what we all want to learn is how to reconnect with that mm -hmm. higher self. Uh, and there's great stories about that that the Gnostics shared with one another and people that connected with that way. And to me, I mean, the, the person that I think, this is a little bit off the topic, but it's sure. related, but a person that it is claimed has connected with his higher guardian angel or is fully tapped in and connected with that self is Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. <laughs> he was supposed to have learned all this incredible ancient magic, some of it coming right. from Aleister Crowley, that enabled him to connect with his higher guardian angel, as they call it or term it, or his higher self that then bestowed upon him this incredible manic genius that, that uh, unleashed all these this incredible music on the world and changed uh, Change the world. He was definitely tuning in to uh, something. Yeah. From somewhere a higher level of guitar playing. Right, for right, sure. right. Yeah, he was on the Olympics. Uh, I saw that. A uh, whole yeah. lot of love in China and <laughs> Beijing. It's like, here, take that. <laughs> now, William, you claim that you, and you, you travel all over the world to sacred sites and mm -hmm. uh, sacred spaces, but uh, one of your major claims, and you do tours of Nashville, yeah. that Nashville is somehow 
related to some kind of ancient mysticism? It's the most amazing story I've ever researched. And as a matter of fact, Nashville to me is one of the, the key sacred sites on the planet right now. Nashville is the only city in the world that has copies of two healing temples from the ancient world. We have Athena's Temple of Holy Wisdom, the Parthenon, right. in Centennial Park. And then at the Bicentennial Mall State Park in front of the state capitol, we have a 2,200 foot long magician's rod that is laid out and growing on 19 acres. And that rod is a virtual mirror image of the most ancient and most profound cosmic axis, as it was called, <clears throat> Mount Meru from Asia. Our Bicentennial Mall and Mount Meru from Mongolia are virtually identical to one another, all by chance, too, because the architect who designed it says that they didn't set out to do this. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is, is that I think they just connected with that higher mind or that yeah. higher mind operated through them to cause this magnificent living temple to be laid out. Is and this the Bicentennial Mall? The Bicentennial okay. Mall, yeah, that's right. It's an extraordinary place. It's got this amazing green space that's lined with oak trees, mm -hmm. okay? The biblical definition of a green space like that lined with oak trees is an Asherah. Mm -hmm. And then at the top of the Bicentennial Mall is what's called the Court of Three Stars. Uh -huh. It's got 50 25-foot tall pillars, stone pillars that have bells in them. So it's, it's a ring of stones, okay? Mm -hmm. When you go into the Bible and you look up a ring of stones or circle of stones, you're led to a place called Gilgal. This is the name of the place where Elijah ascended into the heavens in a whirlwind mm -hmm. while 50 prophets witnessed it. At the Bicentennial Mall, you have the circle of stones, a Gilgal, and there are exactly 50 of these stones. I call that place a Gilgal. Yeah, it's not a coincidence. It's, it's, it's no. amazing. In fact, I, I started <clears throat> researching all this must have been 15 years ago now, I was, I was researching FDR's search for the Holy Grail in Mongolia in 1934. Mm -hmm. His Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace, and a third man named Nicholas Rurik, a world-famous Russian mystic and guru, had reformed the archetypal trio of the three wise men. Mm -hmm. And they sent Nicholas Rurik to Mongolia looking for the reincarnated Jesus and the secrets of the Holy Grail. This started to become common knowledge in, in the 1940s. Well, Henry Wallace wrote a series of letters to Nicholas Rurik during the course of this expedition. And one of those letters suggested to me that Nashville was going to be the place where they were going to return the secrets of the Holy Grail. And so I'm thinking, Nashville? I just, <laughs> so I just start driving around town looking around for, yeah. for evidence of this. And I'm, I'm driving down Jefferson Street and I see this giant red granite monolith with this pattern, this antenna etched on it. And I said, wait a minute, I've seen that before. <laughs> And I went home and I got out my book on mm. Sacred Mountains of Asia and laid side by side this diagram from a second century Chinese manuscript of Mount Meru, the, the axis of the gods, the ladder of the gods, the stairway to heaven, beside the pattern of the Bicentennial Capitol Mall, and they matched. I'm like, that's it right there. Now, why would, why would they show this as an antenna? Well, the yeah. reason is, is because... There's, there's basically four takes on what the Holy Grail is. It's either a cup, mm -hmm. a simple carpenter's cup, which nine out of 10 people go along with that. So that gets rid of nine out of 10 people. Yeah. The other ones look and say, well, I think it might in fact be a bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. That was popularized by the yeah. Da Vinci Code. The third take on what the Grail is, is that it's a stone. Like Christ is referred to as a stone, a missing mm -hmm. capstone or cornerstone, yeah. or so on and so forth. But the fourth take on what the grail is, is it's believed to be the key of life, a tone, a frequency, or a vibration mm. that would be transmitted by an antenna-like device that looks like a magic wand or an antenna. And that's exactly what the Bicentennial Mall is. So really, Jesus having the wand, anything connected to Jesus, that energy is transferred yeah. through the antenna. Right, exactly. And what you have there at the Bicentennial Mall is <clears throat> just a beautiful example of Egyptian technology. It's, it's, it's a living temple made of trees, but when you get into the Court of Three Stars, the, the, it's an altar. And 
the floor of that altar is made of red, white, and blue granite. The Egyptians used red granite as their altar stone because it's loaded with pure quartz crystal. In fact, when you're in the court of three stars, you can look in on a sunny day and you see the quartz glistening in the sunlight. They, they call red quartz or red granite rather an altar stone because it alters you. It holds whatever frequency or vibration is present there. So I've started taking people with crystal bowls down there, chanters. It's, it's like a CD, Tony, that court of three stars with mm -hmm. that red granite and that crystal is recording everything that you feel and say when you're in that, in that space. So what we're doing is intentionally creating a healing space in that place by recording healing tones and vibrations and chants. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary, but that's pure Egyptian technology is what they're using So the purpose there. is for healing and what else? Well, I mean, transformation. <laughs> I mean, that's what I believe the purpose is. The, the, Inner the, transformation? Or? Yeah. I mean, the official purpose of the Bicentennial Capitol Mall is to commemorate Tennessee's Bicentennial and to provide an unobstructed view of the state capitol. Yeah. But what you have here is this magnificent temple that's laid out that if you can learn to walk it and connect with the energy there, there are seven springs that run underneath that complex that are running energy through that place. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the stellar energy coming in as well. Right. And it's all focused on that cord of three stars with that granite, just like a sponge soaking all this stuff up and so that when you enter into that space, you can feel it. And then when you go stand on the iron rod that's drilled directly in the center of the cord of three stars, and you make a sound out loud, you hear this reverberation, this mm -hmm. echo. That point is one of the most profound places I've ever experienced because what you find there at the, at, the, at the mall is that each of the seven energy centers of our body are perfectly marked there with appropriate symbolism. Our body literally is that wand, that magic wand. And in the examples that I show from early Christian art, when Jesus is raising Lazarus from the dead. He's got that magic wand in his hand and he's hitting him right here on the crown chakra. He's awakening his higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so when you enter the court of three stars, it corresponds on the body with right there, the third right, and he's eye. always talking about the body being the temple. The new exactly. temple is not, the, is not a physical structure, but it's your body. Right. And so when you're standing on <clears> that iron rod in the court of three stars, you're standing literally on a point that corresponds with the pineal gland in the very center of our chakra. brain, third eye chakra, the seat mm -hmm. of the soul. And it's not, in my opinion, by coincidence. I think there's something operating down there, and it's a really powerful and profound place. I've walked there with thousands of people over the years and uh, continue to bring people from all over the world and say, hey, if you can't go to Egypt, you can't go to South America, go France, to <laughs> UK, come to Nashville. We got two healing temples for you here, the Temple of Holy Wisdom and this incredible magic wand. Now the state capitol is a pretty amazing building. Have you found anything about it? Or Lots of intriguing it? lore about that. Of course it sits up on that artificially tiered mound. Mm -hmm. All kinds of wacky ideas about what, what's going on with that mound. Yeah. Uh, there was a Catholic church that sat there before the state capitol. Must have been a sacred Indian site before then. Mm -hmm. But you know that whole base of the capitol is sacred. There's an inscription uh, at the Bicentennial Mall that tells you that this place was settled around 900 A.D., which is probably pretty conservative, mm -hmm. and that, in fact, it was a, a sacred burial ground. There, that inscription tells you that vast numbers of bodies were interred there. Mm. When, you know, I don't know what you think when somebody tells you vast numbers of bodies are buried around your state capitol, but it sounds like there's a lot of people. Well, the Capitol's definitely haunted. I used to be a Tennessee State Capitol police officer oh, you did. in another life on wow. third shift. Uh -huh. And you can hear voices in rooms. And when you open the door, it stops. Wow. You shut it back, you can hear. It's like a whole party going on inside. And wow. Footsteps going up and down the marble staircases. And a lot of the officers did report seeing apparitions. I didn't personally see any apparitions. But uh, wow. I know the guy who built the Capitol is buried in the wall. Mm -hmm. and there's William another, Strickland, there's right. There's another yeah. person built, buried in there too, but I don't mm. forget who they are. Uh, yeah, former mm. president, I, I thought. Um, Andrew not, Johnson? No, I can't remember. I don't want to say. But you know, uh, Polk. No. It might be. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, 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 you like to research a lot of ancient texts, obviously. You refer mm -hmm. to the lost yeah, books and that right. kind of thing. And uh, one of the key players in the ancient world was Enoch. 
Mm-hmm. Well, in the 1970s, there was a guy named Dr. J.J. Hertog who wrote a book called The Keys of Enoch. Right. And in that book, he has a map that shows 12 sacred sites that ring the earth, sort of like a, a pearl necklace of sacred sites. The Great mm-hmm. Pyramid of Giza is the centerpiece. Then you've got a place in Mongolia, center of the Atlantic, Hawaii, the usual kind of places. And then he shows two areas that he says are going to become the sort of the hot zones when mm-hmm. the, the Great Awakening occurs, like people talk about in terms of the millennium and that sort of thing. One is in the Four Corners area of the U.S. The other is on a corridor running from Lexington, Kentucky to Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Now, what's intriguing about that is what it suggests to me is that Enoch supposedly uh, knew about these 12 ancient sites going back into the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So maybe the reason why Nashville has this stuff going on now is because a long time ago it was already known as one of these key 12 sites around the planet. And now today it's coming alive again. And we have these temples here, people come to Nashville, it's a center for Bible publishing on the planet. Not Rome, not Jerusalem, Nashville, the buckle of the Bible Belt. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of spiritual energy here. People come to Nashville, they're like, move to Nashville, it's like, why am I here? What am I doing here? And to me, I, I, I just think of the, it's because of the, that spiritual component of, of what we've got going William, on William, your latest book is called Revelation 2012. Mm-hmm. What, what's going to happen in 2012? <laughs> <laughs> More of what's happening now. No, I mean, 2012 is pivotal moment as far as a lot of people are concerned. It's the end of a 5,000 year old Mayan calendar. I mean, something happened 5,000 years ago when the Mayan calendar was initiated. That's when the first dynasty of Egypt was founded. That's when Krishna died. Uh, You also have the Glastonbury Tor was also built there Mm -hmm. in in England. It's a very pivotal time and now those 5,000 years are up. December 21st, 2012, the Mayans say is the end of that calendar. It's also the end of a 26,000 year cosmic cycle and they say this is going to be a moment of uh, cosmogenesis, of rebirth and and renewal. That's just the beginning of it. Um, You've traveled uh, to a lot of these sites like Stonehenge, Mm -hmm. for example. What was the purpose of Stonehenge? Do you have any clue about that? Probably an astronomical calendar would be Mm -hmm. my guess. Yeah. Um, Marker of a earth energy site as well place where you can just go right, get I've heard it was up. a healing place too that mm-hmm. uh, some of the pagan uh, traditions they had right they, they ran water through it and uh, oh really and the person would crawl up in a little in a little circle circular hole there and hmm. and, and, and be, be healed of whatever their malady was Wow <laughs> yeah Stonehenge is cool I, I really enjoyed going there it's kind of it's a lot smaller than you than you think. Uh, when you see pictures of it, just kind of sitting there on the side of the you interstate. Say you say you saw a crop, there was a crop circle near there? Yes. Or yeah. Recently? Yeah. Yeah. When, what kind of crop circle was it? Well, it was a eight petaled flower mm. or ninja star is the, the name they've given to it. It's about mm. 300 feet across. And uh, actually, I, I, uh, I feel stuff um, when I get around like certain Egyptian statues or mm-hmm. temples. Uh, all of a sudden, my heart chakra, it's like a dowsing rod. It just opens up. It's just something that happens. Something that happened after I went to Egypt one time. And uh, so actually I felt the crop circle before we even saw it. So it's like emanating this, this incredible field and then you enter into this and you know, like the first time you see the Great Pyramid, the, you're, you're dealing with something, a whole, a whole other kind of, a whole other deal there. Whole new level. Whole new level, exactly. <laughs> There's just no way that, you know, come on, Egyptian slaves did not build those pyramids. Not happening. Same kind of feeling when you get into a crop circle. It's like, okay, I don't know who did this, but, you know, they're, they're not hanging out at, at Walmart, you know. What's the guy in Egypt that's the uh, Dr. Zahi Hawass. Zahi Hawass. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's on coast to coast a lot. Right. Uh, he probably doesn't like your theories uh, so much because, I mean, he, he wants to promote the theory that the Egyptians built right. the pyramids. And may, maybe they did, but sure. if they did, they had some advanced technology to do it, right? Right, right. Yeah, Zahi, uh, I because I, I, I tread where he won't go. I'll bring up the A word, Atlantis, and Ooh. drives him just <laughs> insane. You no, know, he's got a he's got a monopoly there. He's got a mm-hmm. you know a, a heck of a deal going, and doesn't want anything to 
jeopardize that. He's, you know, an accomplished guy on his own, but he also, you know, wants to be a, a world famous media star too. And so, right. you know, those are kind of two, you know, being the curator of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization, being a media star, I'm not sure they go together because, right. you know, I, I don't know. I, I just think that if you're either going to be a researcher and you're going to do the work, or you know, you're going to be the people that, that tell people about it. Yeah, some of these live discoveries are a little suspicious when he, Very he breaks suspicious. through and, oh, there's a sarcophagus. Oh, wow. Right, exactly. It's like you think, well, maybe they were in there before. Exactly. You know? They kind of knew they were going to find something. But, you know, on the other hand, he is calling a lot of attention to Egypt, bringing sure. a lot of people there. That's very important. And uh, so I tip my hat off to him for all the work that he does with that. Absolutely. Now, the, the Edgar Casey had said that the Library of Alexandria was uh, beneath the paws of the Sphinx. The that, Hall of correct? Records, yeah. The Hall of Records. The Hall of Records, yeah. That's sort of the, that's the big deal in Egypt. You know, Herodotus was a, a historian who said that there's a 1,500-room labyrinth beneath the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a king's chamber in the Great Pyramid that's made of these 250 and 300-ton red granite blocks. It's absolutely massive. That Great Pyramid has room for 40 king's chambers. Wow. We found one. Okay. Now, isn't the king's chamber, there's a, there's a stone coffer in there that's the same dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's got to be some kind of related type technology. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's no doubt that much of the biblical stuff comes from from the Great Pyramid. We got about a minute left. Can you well, tell us about the Spear of Destiny in a minute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Spear of Destiny. You know, in legend, it's the spear that pierced the, the side of Jesus when mm -hmm. he's on the cross. But when you see the drawings of it. Uh, like, for example, Heinrich Himmler had a drawing of it, the, the Nazi uh, second-in-command to, to, to Adolf Hitler, and it looked like a particle accelerator, a modern-day particle accelerator, a weapons system. Mm. You just have to wonder, well, wait a minute, you, you know, how did they get, somebody's telling a story here, and you just wonder who's really telling the truth. Wasn't Hitler trying to uh, find this? So. Yeah, and the, so was FDR. And the reason mm -hmm. both FDR and Hitler were looking for the secrets of the Holy Grail is because they knew those secrets could be weaponized. They knew that what you're dealing with is not the fairy tale cartoon character stuff that you get in church. What, what Jesus and the disciples were dealing with was hardcore esoteric science that could be used right. for peaceful purposes to create a, a, a paradise on this planet, or unfortunately those secrets could be weaponized. Right. Most technology could be used for good or evil. Exactly. Well, William, we're at the end of the program. It's been my pleasure to Likewise. have you Likewise. Thank you, Tony. Mystery Us. Thank yeah. you so much. My pleasure. Yeah.